today we're going to look at various forms of influence, of power, of use of politics in the organization. Power, easy to use and so easy to abuse. How is it that we manage to exploit situations where we have power? One of the things we're going to take a close look at today. But first, let's try to sort out the difference between influence, power, and politics. If we can go to the first of the overheads. Okay, influence, which is the outcome of an attempt to change someone's behavior or attitude. You might try to influence someone and not be successful at it. It doesn't work. Your influence doesn't work. But in this case, we're actu it's the actual manipulation, the intent to get someone to change and do them, do what you want them to do or think what you want them to think. Power is the means by which you accomplish this. What of the various sources of power that you have available are you going to be able to use what's going to be the best one to use to get somebody to change and do what you want them to do? And politics, the pursuit of self-interest in an organization to protect or to further either individual or organizational goals. Politics and self-interest, all used in the organization. What is a manager? A manager is somebody who gets things done through other people. You have sources of power. You will need to use wisely, <coughs> intelligently, and humanely the sources of power that you have available. What are some of the ways in which you can influence somebody? If we go to the second. Rational persuasion. All of your logical arguments, all of the information that you have to bear on an issue, to try to get someone to see your point of view. We've just come through the political campaign. It's been the political season. All of those candidates out there were using, in part, rational persuasion. This is why you should vote for me. These are the logical arguments that I present to you. But that's not all that's used. One of the other things is emotional appeals. And we can think of advertising as a good example for this. And then we'll come to organizations. What does advertising do? Well, it's a massive attempt, a macro attempt, to try to get us to change our attitudes and change our behavior by something other than what we were buying. How do they get this to do these sort of things? What are the appeals that they're using? Sometimes rational, but a lot of emotional appeal too. Buy this product because you'll be a better person. <laughs> By buying the product somehow, you'll be smarter, you'll be classier, you'll be hipper, you'll be more with it somehow. Buy the product. Or buy the product to avoid some horrible, embarrassing situation, fear. All of those hygiene products that are out there, the mouthwash, etc., all use fear as an underlying tactic in order to persuade us to do something. Or do something out of loyalty. Let's go back to the campaign. Be a loyal Democrat. <laughs> Be a loyal Republican. Stand up for your party. <coughs> do something because you identify with a group, and because you identify with the group, you're loyal to those kinds of things. Emotional appeals that are used and used in organizations, you bet, okay? This is the way we do things in this organization. The sense of values and the sense of loyalty. Do it because 
you identify with this organization, and this is how the organization engages in certain activities. So emotional appeals. Exchange <coughs> rewards quid pro quo. You persuade somebody to do something for you because you're going to do a favor in exchange. Help me out with this and I'll help you with something else. Things that I see happening all the time. The exchanges that go on, the favors that go on, people do in terms of persuading. And finally, norms are used. Norms are used in the form of policies, procedures. This is our standard operating procedure. This is our policy. This is how you have to do it, no question. It's laid out for you. Or this is our tradition. It's not written into law, but no one here has ever done, thing, uh, done anything otherwise than this way. Our tradition, it defines us. And that's using the power of norms to persuade you to do things. So a number of available influence tactics that we have. And what about power? Power is the force available to motivate change in somebody. And we can really look at two sources of power, two classifications that are available. Power that derives from a position. It's attached to a role that you're playing in an organization. And everybody who has that role has that power. You're the president of the company. There are certain things you can do as president of the company that you can't do if you're lower down on the organizational chart. And if you're at the bottom of the organizational chart, there are a lot of things that are not available to you. A lot of decisions you can't make, a lot of discretion you don't have. So what are these sources of individual power that are available? Legitimate power, power that is derived from a person's position of authority, the president, the financial officer, the chief technical officer, whoever fills these positions, the manager, whoever it is, there are descriptions that are written in that tell you what you can do because you're in that position. Your boss tells you to do something. How often do you question? the authority that you attach to the boss. They're paying my wages. In exchange for the wages, I have to do what I'm told to do. This is, as long as it's described as a legitimate request. You have to be really careful on that because there are requests made that are not legitimate and sometimes you go along with it anyway out of fear or out of some other pressure tactic that might be there. One of the reasons that we have policies and organizations specifying what constitutes sexual harassment has to do with requests made that are not legitimate in an organization. And yet we know by all of the cases that we see on court TV that in fact these requests were made or the cases that we read about in newspapers. So you have to be really cautious there. Uh, or cautious in other areas about what people are expected to do because now it violates the norm. At one point, the position of secretary included almost anything the boss requested. But now we know that it's more circumscribed and maybe it's not appropriate to ask the secretary to type your son's homework not a legitimate request, okay? So it's authority is there, but circumscribed. One of the other authorities, uh, one of the other powers that you have is reward power. This derives from the ability to create positive outcomes for somebody, to provide positive outcomes as a manager your recommendation as to who gets the pay increase 
is adhered to. Your recommendation as to who gets the promotion is adhered to. You have direct access to give people good assignments and to give people boring, dull, monotonous assignments. You have the ability to give people good schedules and the ability to give people back-breaking schedules. Reward power. And beyond that, you have the power to always give people attention, recognition, some kind of affirmation for what they're doing. So you have this source of power, and it derives specifically from the position that you're in. It means something because of that position. Closely related to it is coercive power, the power to punish, the power to withhold certain things from people. Clearly can be done. Most directly, you can bawl somebody out in public, criticize them. What a lousy job you did in front of everybody. That's power. Diminishes the individual makes the individual very cautious around you, but that's power. You, may be, you can directly withhold recommendations for pay increases, promotion. You can give lousy performance appraisals. Okay, now we're not talking about things that are deserved. I'm not talking about a performance appraisal um, that is negative because the person has performed poorly. That you honestly have to do. What we're talking about is using this power in an arbitrary, capricious, and denigrating, demeaning way to an individual. The power to punish, to block certain things from going on, comes from your position. Wouldn't matter if somebody else said it. You could sort of shrug it off and say, who cares about that individual? But you do care because it's somebody above you in the organization, and they can thwart a number of things that you might want in the organization. These are various position powers. But there are, if we go to the next one, a number of powers that pertain to the individual, things the individual brings to the plate. And what are these sorts of powers? Information. Power which comes from access to information that is important to the organization. With widespread availability of information to people, you can go anywhere on the internet and tap into all kinds of information that's out there. You can write the government and ask for information, and under the um, I don't know, Freedom of Information Act is, I believe, what we call it. There are a number of things that you can get out of the government that were even once classified, if you persist. So we may think that this is perhaps not as important, because so many people have access to information that one person might have walked around with at one time. But in fact, in organizations, information remains vitally important. And the term that's used is competitive intelligence. Information used to give organizations a competitive edge against whoever the competition is out there. What are they developing? I want to develop it faster. Where's the market going on something? Okay, I want to be there to provide the product or the service that somebody's going to want and provide it better make it easier to use. So competitive intelligence, extremely important. And that's why you find more and more corporations are involved with what are called knowledge specialists, uh, sometimes known as corporate librarians. So that we you know, used to think of the job as the librarian as somebody who would work in an academic institution or in a public institution. But many, many corporations now employ corporate librarians, or as we say, the corporate information <laughs> specialist is the latest jargon that's used. And this individual amasses information for the various people who are in the organization. 
and searches out things that they're going to need that they might not have ready access to or they might not even think about, again, to help give them competitive edges. So, okay, but it has to be knowledge that's important to the organization. And those people who hold that knowledge hold power over individuals. In the day when J. Edgar Hoover headed the FBI and he had all kinds of secret knowledge about all kinds of activities, very private, private lives of public individuals, he had enormous power. And he was able to stay in the position he was in because, in part, he had this powerful information that people didn't want particularly revealed. The director of the budget knows all of the numbers better than lots of other people in the organization. That person has power. People who are in information systems have power by virtue of the information that they can control and distribute. So very important piece and something that you can accrue on your own by seeking out and getting information. Another aspect of individual power is expert power, very close to information power, but power that derives because you have particular skills and abilities that nobody else has. No one else can do that. And so you become extremely powerful. No one else can do what Michael Jordan does. We see the power of that individual, the franchise. People who bring particularly good skills into a position and gain power because of that. Not just in sports, happens in organizations too. Somebody who's so good at it that if you got rid of this individual, you fear that the organization would be so much worse for losing that individual. And so you want that person. Agents in Hollywood want to have certain stars, or property as they call them, signed up because these people are so good. Whenever they perform, usually the films rake in millions. Hot property, as they say. Power, expert power, the, what these people can contribute to the situation that nobody else could bring to the situation. And so if you are very skilled at what you do, you accrue expert power in the organization. And people start to come to you to ask you for help and ask you for information. And each time you help and each time you give something, you are accruing power. The last of the individual powers is referent power. The power to influence by virtue of your magnetic, energetic, charismatic personality, because people like you and want to be like you. The most recent dramatic, vivid example that I can give of the um, charismatic personality and referent power is uh, the bizarre case of Marshall Applewhite. If you all remember, um, is it about a year, in, a year ago, two years ago? Um, <coughs> the, um, <clears throat> the group that committed mass suicide out in California to go to another planet, and they followed the leader, Applewhite, and all took some poison simultaneously. Because imagine the power that he had over these individuals, of what they were going to gain by it. Okay, so we see in cults the um, applicability, the operation, the activity of referent power. But it happens, fortunately, outside of cults, but not to that extent. Most people don't give their lives um, <clears throat> in terms of following individuals. But there are situations where people copy other individuals, want to be like other individuals. Those individuals are very charismatic and very persuasive. Sometimes we see it in politicians who have that uh, capability and have a coterie of people around them. They just want to be like that person. Clinton, to a certain extent, has a following of people who are very loyal to him. 
and um, look up to him as the model. In sports, we see that as well. People who want to be like that individual and the following around that individual. Okay, referent power. That power doesn't transfer to anybody. That stays with the individual. Um, defining the charismatic personality is difficult. We don't really know how to train somebody to be charismatic. It seems to come naturally to them. But there are certain things that charismatic individuals do, and we'll pick up a little bit more on it when we study leadership as well, because if we knew how to train somebody, it certainly would be useful. One of the things that they seem to do is to give people a good sense of themselves, a good sense of their own worthwhile in ways that other individuals don't seem to have the capacity of doing. They make people feel good about themselves and in the process then make them want to contribute to the cause, whatever the cause is. So all of these various sources of power are available to individuals who are working in organizations. Which brings us then to the issue of, briefly, organizational politics. Okay, the pursuit of self-interest in an organization to protect or further either individual or organizational goals. Self-interest, not always used for yourself, okay, but in the process, it will help you along as well. Something to be used in an organization? We'll see. I'm going to put it on hold for just a minute, though. Because what we want to do is look at some ways of analyzing power in organizations. Basically, we'll take a look at two models to sort of explain what's going on at this one with the various types of arrows going up or down. The resource dependency model. Controlling the resources. This model proposes that organizations are these interlocking units, departments, that rely on each other for resources. Some of them have needed resources, and they all need resources. And the question is, what's more critical to the organization, the resources that they control and give out to people, or the resources that they're going to need from other units. The ones that control the important needed resources, those uh, fat arrows pointing up, are going to be the units that are going to be more powerful. The ones that need important resources, okay, but don't control them in any fashion, will be less powerful. And the ones that control resources that people don't see as being particularly important, again, are less powerful. So if we go back to that overhead and take a look at it, very often production departments, units in organizations are very powerful because they're producing something that's the core thing, the core service, the core product. They're controlling that production. Okay, now it's true they're going to need other, can we keep that up for a minute? Go back one more time. Thanks. Okay, I'll tell you when to get off it. Um, it's true that uh, they're going to need important resources, but relative to other units, they've got control of this very important one. Personnel departments have historically been seen as weak units in organizations. They need important resources to go. They need budgets. They need money from other units to develop. Um, but they've not been seen as controlling important resources, even though they're responsible for bringing individuals in. That's changed. But they've been seen as money consumers and not money generators. Okay? If you generate money, then you're seen as controlling an important resource. Engineering, you know, true it's important and sometimes going to be more important, particularly when they're going through model changes, but it may not be seen as a revenue generator in an organization controlling important resources. So it's the balance between what you need and what you control and what's important to the organization in terms of analysis. 
Okay, so let's go to the next one and take a look at that. The strategic contingencies model. This explains power in terms of the capacity to control activities of other units. And there are four factors that are important <coughs> in explaining this control. First is scarcity. When resources are scarce, power gets magnified. And those units of an organization that control scarce resources, they seem to get more resources that are important to the organization than other units, then going to have that unit as being more powerful. Academic departments that can get grants from outside agencies at a time when money is tight become more powerful. So scarcity figures into that. A second aspect of it is centrality. Some units perform functions that are more critical to the core goals, objectives, and technologies of an organization than other units. And they affect other units. Very often, accounting departments are sort of central. Everybody needs the money out of accounting. That's where the bills get paid for certain things. Uh, it, it pays people within the organization, and it pays the outside vendors in the organization. So the centrality of something like an accounting department could raise its power in the organization. Another aspect of it is substitutability. A subunit has little power if somebody else can perform its functions. Back in the 80s, I believe, there was a group out there, I think, OK, good, called the air traffic controllers that thought if they went on strike, they would shut down the US. And on first thought, it seemed logical. No airport can function without the air traffic controllers. So it not only creates a snarl in the US, people can't get to where they need to go. We're dependent on airplanes, and freight can't get to where it has to go quickly. But it also causes backup around the world. This is really a catastrophic situation. The air traffic controllers walked. They didn't count on one thing substitutability. President Reagan called in <coughs> air traffic controllers from the military, staffed all the towers, and things kept working as usual. In fact, the Union was virtually destroyed. And it took a long time for many of them to get back in and accept the jobs. They forgot to count on substitutability. Uh, there was one time when postal workers went on strike in some area, and the National Guard was brought in to deliver the mail. Not only did they deliver the mail, they delivered it better than the postal workers. Because of this issue of substitutability, we've seen the development of UPS. We've seen the development of Federal Express. Alternate routes for where the Postal Department once thought it had everything. People look for alternate routes. And if they can find them, it lowers the power of that organization. Because so many companies were dependent on UPS, it was the sole delivery um, source for organizations. Many of them were left high and dry when the drivers went on strike. Now, they're still not back at full power because some people have found alternate routes to use. And we'll have that in mind. Uh, so organizations need to think about how substitutable they are in terms of their power 
And in terms of whether if they're not there, they're going to absolutely knot things up. They're not other people who can come in and do things. Municipal governments are sometimes tied up in knots. If an organization, a unit like the garbage collectors, go out on strike, who's there to collect the garbage? And the answer is private haulers for some things, like commercial institutions, but for residential, nobody in the stuff piles up, and it's horrendous. It's a, it's a hazard. So there isn't, in that case, substitutability. Uh, we don't have substitutability for fire departments and police departments. We're very reliant on them. So uh, they have a lot of power because of that. They're critical, they're central, and there isn't substitutability on all of these things. Where organizations look to outsource, get rid of a unit, not only is the unit weakened, it's essentially dissolved, it's gone. And companies are looking now to outsource in lots of different areas because they think it can be done more economically. Uh, and if there is a problem, they're not hung up, they can always find another agency. You can fire the whole agency and get another agency. So there is outsourcing done in uh, maintenance in a lot of organizations, as an example. And you don't like the maintenance work that's going on, the janitorial work? Fire the agency that you're working with. Um, outsourcing done in other areas as well, of organizations. Sometimes they outsource uh, certain, uh, I'm going to say, sometimes some of engineering gets outsourced and goes to outside agencies that bring in bench workers or something like that for a period of time. But they're working for the agency. They're not working for the organization. OK, so it reduces that unit's power within the organization if there's some alternate route that the organization can use. And finally, uncertainty. To the extent that a unit can reduce uncertainty for the organization, then so much more the power of that organization. What kind of units reduce uncertainty? Marketing, which predicts demand for certain products, reduces uncertainty for the organization. Um, information services, which again keeps track of all the inventories that are going on and can predict kind of seasonal ebbs and flows, reduces uncertainty for the organization. So uh, any forecasting unit reduces uncertainty for the organization. Organizations don't like chaos. They like predictability. They like to know, because that way they control what's going on. You know exactly what you have to do in an organization. You know how much you have to produce. You know how much you need to turn out in the way of services, what the demand is going to be like. So you don't have too much or you don't have too little. You need that kind of certainty out there. And you need groups that can help predict how much you're going to add on. And that's exactly what we've got now coming up to, as it were now, the Christmas Russian organizations. How much do they have to add on and stock in companies, in stores, so that they can com meet consumer demand? Last year, there was a phenomenon that happened that left companies and stores absolutely short. The phenomenon was called Tickle Me Elmo. Some of you, or maybe all of you, know what Elmo is, uh, that cute little doll that giggled. And no one expected it to take off the way it did. It was one of those unpredictable things. Apparently, the manufacturer of it sent a few to Rosie O'Donnell. She had it on the show and talked about it with a few other people. And that was the beginning of it catching. And stores ran out of it. And people were willing to pay all kinds of outrageous amounts and advertise for getting it. Had they been able to predict the demand, so much better for the company. Well, they did fill the demand, but by that time, the Christmas rush was over. And people were left with a lot of Tickle Me Elmos. So it's nice to know, get some idea of what the demand is going to be, and get the product to where it has to be on time. Reduce uncertainty for the organization. Um, that's how they make their money. 
the strategic contingencies model. It tells you something about how organizations can, or units in organizations can amass um, <coughs> power. Politics, now we come to that political thing <coughs> in the organization. Tactics. How is it that people actually use politics to build power in organizations? There are a number of tactics that are used, which build on what we talked about in terms of power. Controlling access to information is a political tactic. You withhold information. People do this all the time, particularly so you don't look bad. You're not going to reveal everything that's out there. Well, eventually, you're going to have to reveal everything. We just have the case of Oxford Health Organization, which ultimately had to reveal how bad things were in the organization in terms of their not being on top of knowing how many individuals were enrolled in the organization. They overestimated that by, I don't know, something like 30,000. I don't remember the number exactly, but by a large amount. They underestimated the amount of revenue that they were going to need for paying doctors, and their shares plummeted enormously. But they are a publicly owned company, and all of that stuff is audited and comes out. And they had to come out in front of it and reveal the information, and now they're trying to rebuild credibility, particularly with people who are on Wall Street who would be buying their stock. They want that stock to go back up again. You control information by avoiding people you don't want to reveal information to. Another way of controlling information. And another way seems just the opposite. You overwhelm people with information. You go in with masses of statistics as a way of trying to control the situation, to try to convince somebody. You oversell them. But it looks like you've done your homework and going with those masses of information. You may not even get all the way through it, but somebody looks at all the piles of it and say, all right, I'm convinced. <laughs> you've got the numbers. You've argued well for yourself. So you can use, you can withhold, or you can overwhelm with information. Either way, you've got a tactic to help get you to a position that you want to get to. You want somebody to engage in a certain type of behavior. Another way, another power tactic, political tactic, is to build a favorable impression of yourself. If people think favorably of you in organizations, then presumably they'll listen to you more in organizations. How do you build a favorable impression? Well, a couple of ways of doing it. One way is the old-fashioned way, work at it. Do your work diligently and do it competently. But do it, OK? But then you have to add to it. It's not enough to do your work. You have to make your work visible. Other people need to know that you're doing something. So you need to shine a little light on your work, OK? And some people think that you can build a favorable impression just by looking good in an organization. Dress for success. Look the role. To some people, that may work. Okay? But the notion of building a favorable impression, working at it, and later on when you need to persuade people, you have that going in your behalf. You're the competent individual in the organization. Building a support base in the organization. Some people have described politics as the art of clout. Getting it and maintaining it. How do you get this clout, this political clout? You do it by doing things for other people. And we'll look at this next time when we start to look at leadership. But how is it that a politician builds clout? They do favors for other people. You start out. There are certain things that you can accomplish. And people need you to do that. Okay? And then later, as you do these things, for individuals in the organization, quid pro quo. You call the chips back in. You gather the chips back in from individuals for whom you've done things, and they've become, they know they can count on you. You're a loyal person. 
And now, when you ask them for a favor in return, it's easy to collect that favor in return. Support my position. Okay? I've helped you in your various positions before. This is what I think is the appropriate way to move, the appropriate strategy. I need your help now. And remember what I did for you. Vote for me. Blaming and attacking others when things go bad. Don't let it fall on you. When the mess hits the fan, duck. Get out of the way. Find the sacrificial goat or lamb or the scapegoat. Done all the time in organizations. Built in in organizations. When things get bad, somebody's head is going to be on the chopping block. But rarely will it be the CEO. I mentioned Oxford Health Organization. The chief financial officer has just resigned. Somebody is paying a sacrifice there. Even though it's denied that it's his fault that things went bad, you have to look as if you're doing something in an organization and making change. And you do it by sacrificing somebody in the organization. As a matter of fact, in terms of blaming other people, usually deniability is built into the top person's role. Remember the old Mission Impossible? The disclaimer that if this doesn't work well, that uh, Central will deny any knowledge of this event, that's built into organizations. The person who was at the top had no knowledge about this happening down below, kept in the dark about it, never informed. And so their head is not on the chopping block, okay, but people below are going to take it. Finally, networking. Building coalitions, building blocks, building uh, caucuses, whatever. The power of individuals united together. Unions, we see this happening all the time. People band together to try to make change and to increase their power. They join with others. And as a unit, they're listened to. Individually, no. Various interest groups that form together to try to affect change in various areas. So political tactics. But we have problems, because I started by beginning and saying power, easy to use, easy to abuse. And I want to describe to you a very well-known piece of research in an organization, in, in, in social psychology that was done, to show you the ease at which power can be abused. The research was done by Stanley Milgram. It's known as obedience to authority, and you may have heard of it somewhere along the line. Essentially, he did it to try to understand why there was so much obedience during the Third Reich in Nazi Germany, people who were seemingly normal, who complied with outrageous demands made of them. And was this normal or was this some kind of aberration? He set up a situation. He was on the faculty of Yale, and initially he did the research in his laboratory got results, and they said, well, yeah, but that's because you work with students. So he carried it out in New Haven in general. Situation was like this. It was set up as, a, as the, um, an experiment in learning, the effect of punishment on ability to learn. And two people came in to the room at a time, drew straws as to who would be the teacher and who would be the student in this situation. It was always rigged so that one of the persons who walked in was a collaborator with the experiment, and that person would always be the student, and the real subject would always be the teacher in the situation. It was a verbal learning situation where uh, you had to learn a word that was associated with another word on a list of it. And the punishment was, or so the real subject was led to believe, shock if there was a mistake. Starting at low voltage, and they actually gave him a very mild jolt to show that it was real. Okay, after that, 
there was never any real shock delivered. I just thought they were delivering shock. Um, the student went into the student's booth, so they were separated. They couldn't see each other. All they could do was communicate over microphones. And there was this large box that the real teacher sat in front of with levers. The levers increased at 15 volts. So it started at 15, went up to 450, and there were labels at various points. I've distributed to you this sheet of paper, which lists the various levels and the danger points attached, the warning points attached at certain areas. Each time a mistake was made, presumably by the student, you had to go up a level. My question for you is, how far do you think the subjects went in terms of shock administration? Did they stop at moderate shock? Did they go on to very strong shock? Did they go to extremely intense shock? Did they go all the way to the end? On the average, OK, I'm going to put some people on the spot. And I think I'll start with Sylvia. What do you think? I would say they would stop at moderate shock. Moderate they shock. OK, does anybody have any other thoughts? Anthony. I would say that they might go all the way to the end with the feeling that, well, it's science being done by scientists. It must be safe. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any opinion on this? Daniel? I think they would go to extreme intense shock. You said the average, right? The average person. I think the average person would have gone to extreme. Extreme intense shock, but not all the way to the end. No. OK. I'll read you the figures. OK, of this research that was done, Five stopped at intense, eight more at extreme, one at dangerous, and 26 went to the end. Anthony's got it. <laughs> he wins the prize today. Astounding. Okay, there was never any real shock delivered, okay? But they thought they delivered shock. Uh, I've seen movies that were taken of this. They were nervous in doing it. They, they, the, the people who were subjects said, do I have to do all of this? Do I have to go to the end? And there was a researcher in the white lab coat who would say, it's my responsibility. You don't worry about it. Go to the end. And most of them did. Nobody held a gun to the person's head and said, you know, I'm going to shoot if you don't. They could have stopped. They didn't stop. They followed the authority. So I offer this up as an example of the ease at which somebody in a position of power, the researcher, who says, my responsibility, can abuse authority. Does it happen in real organizations that authority is abused uh, and that it's on one side and that it's not questioned on the other side? And the answer is, yeah. In hospitals, doctors give orders all the time. Some of those orders should be questioned. Do the nurses question them? Not that often. They're getting better at it. They're being trained now uh, to uh, be more independent. And some naturally are more independent. And the status of doctors has come down over what it was. So it's not quite the same. But you know, research shows that in hospitals, that there is a tendency for orders, doctors' orders to be fulfilled without questioning, even if somebody thinks there's something peculiar about it. I think I've talked about the um, research in the cockpit, going along with captains who have authority in the cockpit, uh, so that there is this tendency, once you're in a position of power, to not have your authority questioned. People go along with you, which means on the flip side, as a leader, you've got to be vigilant about what you're doing with your power to individuals. Are you using it to make unreasonable demands that will be seen as being legitimate because you're in that position, because you have the power to reward, and because you have the power to punish? All three of those things combine to make somebody in 
a position of authority more powerful than they may even contemplate. Something that needs to be reflected on. And it brings us to the issue of ethics. Uh, well, political action, when it occurs, we'll sort of briefly go through that. Uh, when resources are scarce, more likely to get it. When there are conflicting interests, and when there is uncertainty. But the ethics are really the issue that I want to talk about because we get real ethical dilemmas in using power in organizations. They tend to occur particularly where there are employee conflicts of interests, where people are confused about drawing the line in terms of accepting gifts. It's absolutely spelled out in a lot of organizations. You can't take gifts from vendors who would love to ply you with gifts and tickets to the Knicks and the Nets and the Jets to get you to buy their product. But very often, this is seen as being unethical. You're taking it because now you're using that vendor, not because you think the product is nice, but because you love those ringside seats, those floor seats at the Knicks games. Not a right thing to do. Um, sexual harassment has turned out to be a large problem in organizations. Uh, and it was unreported for many years. But now it's clearly laid out. Organizations have policies on this. And uh, the reporting and the monitoring goes on all the time in this area. Um, getting better at it. Uh, the unfortunate side of that is organizations used to be places where people could socialize. And now they don't know what the rules are anymore. And so there's probably less socialization going on. And personnel decisions based on favoritism. Another problem in organization that happens is you get into positions of power. <coughs> You're in that position, and you can do things. Again, you can abuse it, OK? Uh, and you make your decision based on what people can do for you or your friends or whatever. So there are ethical issues, and they always attach to the powerful situation. So what we want to take, again, a next look at is why do these happen in organizations? Gain, greed, Wall Street. People do things in organizations because they are going to realize a fast, short-term, sizable gain for doing something. You have information about what a company is going to do on Wall Street. You can use that insider information to make a lot of money for <coughs> yourself. Not ethical, not done, but you know it is done. There, there are rules there. You'll get in trouble with the SEC when you get caught, but companies are always being cited by the SEC for infractions of things that they're doing on Wall Street. So yeah, people do these unethical things because they're going to realize <coughs> money for it very quickly. Or role conflict is another issue. Uh, you do something because you're trying to wear a couple of hats at once, and you're not sure exactly what role you should be playing in the organization. Uh, are you a scientist or a manager? The Challenger incident. OK? Uh, in fact, it was people higher up in the organization, the role conflict, if we don't get this missile into orbit now, we're going to fall behind on our schedule. Role conflict versus thinking about the safety issues that should have been considered. Competition. You do it because you want that contract. Sometimes what happens in the process, underbid and then substitute poor materials. You couldn't possibly do it for the price that you're doing it at. How do you do it? Well, you get unethical. You substitute. And once you've got the bid, now you've got to figure out how to do it. You substitute poor materials. Of course, if you're on the government side, you can always figure out cost overruns of some sort and build that in. Uh, but that's not so easy to do anymore either. And sometimes it's just the organizational culture. Does the, organizational, does the organization provide, by leadership examples, how you should behave? Are the people who are in leadership positions 
acting in ethical ways. If people at the top are cutting corners on things, then people lower down will cut corners on things. Some organizations seem to run into more trouble than others. Organizations now try to educate people who are making decisions, at least in terms of what is the legal thing that we have to do in this situation. We need to be in compliance of what is the legal thing. But some are going further than what is the legal thing and saying what is the ethical issue in this situation? What is the right thing to do? Besides, because sometimes the legal decision leaves you unsatisfied. It's legally correct, yet somehow you feel as if it's not right. And the best way to convey that is you watch decisions that are made in court. We watch people who are defendants in cases seemingly get off because of a technicality in the law. It's legal. It's the legal thing to do. But it leaves us feeling as if it's not the right thing to do because somebody who is clearly guilty seems to be walking around out there because of a technicality. The evidence wasn't kept together properly or something like that. So we feel not right. And so the distinction between the two, and that's tough to get organization, people in organizations educated to the various nuances of what is the ethical thing that we should be doing in these situations. And sometimes it's not so clear cut. Because if you make a decision, for instance, maybe on the side of something regarding the environment, you're now also going to cause people to lose jobs. Some quick guidelines to look at, okay, this roadmap here, where we start out with the first thing and ask the question about the behavior. Do the tactics promote purely selfish interests? If the answer to that is clearly yes, the only one who's benefiting is you. It's unethical, probably. Uh, if not, ne ask the next question, uh, does it respect the rights of stakeholders, people who have an interest? If the answer is no, unethical. If yes, you go on to the next one. And the next one is one of those ambiguous gray areas. Does it meet standards of fairness? What we carry around in our heads of standards of fairness. There has to be some guidelines given on that in organizations as to what is fair not easy. If it meets the notions of fairness, it's probably ethical. Could be political, but will also be ethical. So if we wrap about where we've been today, we've looked at power from an individual and organizational perspective, how it's used, and how it is easily abused in organizations. And next time, we build on the notions of power and begin to look at issues of leadership in organizations.